Hello and welcome to another Wrestling Roundtable Discussion Podcast. I'm Adam Wilborn from What Culture, joined by the Dudley Boys of What Culture, Michael Hamlet and Michael Sidgwick, to discuss another burning wrestling issue. But before we get into it, if you're a fan of this sort of thing, make sure you subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on either iTunes or Spotify for daily podcasts where we review Raw, SmackDown, pay per views, we have interviews, more roundtable discussions, and a round of the week complete with a bloody good quiz, of course, on wrestle culture but gents the question i want you to ask me today is who should go into the hall of fame for wwe in 2019 it's okay if i just start this podcast like i do everyone by saying sean waltman's name like the fact that he's not involved with wwe in any capacity including the hall of fame is a crime every single one of his best mates from an industry from years gone by all of triple h's best mates they've had their own extra curtain calls at hall of fames in year gone by there he is every year watching friend a friend b friend c friend d going and yet arguably kind of the most the the key to the talent behind the click remains on the outside and i don't quite understand it years and years ago triple h talked about why china couldn't get in might have been because what they could find on the internet surely enough people have forgot about X, what expat might have done that he can go in pretty much scot-free at this point he was the measuring stick for a while as well with wwe wasn't he absolutely and deservedly so like he was part of the company it, it, like there were so many different rosters that came through while sean Morton was on it he took a break to wcw like a lot of guys did sort of 96 97 but when he came back in the attitude era he was as valuable to a, an entirely different generation of performers as he was when he was a one, two, three kid. Like two or three years back in the 90s might have been as well, a decade. And he was like bouncing off big guys in the early 90s as he was kind of getting over an entire new generation of talent like in 98, 99. And I just think he was so valued then how he's not been given sort of a legacy more befitting what WWE like to do for their kind of long tenured performers. I don't quite understand it. It's weird. It's like they've been worked by this whole X-Pac Heat thing mm. and it's somehow diminished his legacy. And I think that is the most insulting thing. It's almost as insulting to me as Marty Jannetty being the punchline. Yeah for being like the lesser of a tag team where he was the other singles guy went on to great more success like x-pac heat is an abomination of a phrase i cannot stand it and the guy to me i don't think he should be remembered as x-pac i think he should be remembered as the one two three kid x-pac heat as well is a good example of something like call it baron corbin heat yeah for christ's sake <laughs> well, a lot of the attitude era is obviously like you know bathed in this nostalgic glow but when you go back and watch x-pac matches like you separate yourself from what x-pac heat was a real thing at the time you know fans genuinely felt it but now you can just watch the matches and appreciate them for what they are they stand alone and they almost always stand up as well he and was you... over for like road dog in 99 he had like a year where he was really over and mm. people tired of him big time as well i think a lot of it was because when the radicals and kurt angle came into the mid card and just breathed new life into it and just raised the quality level exponentially there wasn't really a place for the x-packs who was not quite as good as he was as the mm. one two three kid then um or the road dogs so there's other performers who kind of got lost in that shuffle and yet x-packs remembered as the one and he had more talent than the lot yeah it really infuriates me. It really does. I don't want to make us all feel very old around this table, but you mentioned there him as the one, two, three kid. And, and some, sometimes I think certainly younger fans of, of WWE don't really know as much about that, whereas it was an incredible achievement what he did at such an early age. Yeah, I mean, people talk about how Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels were like the more slender, slight, technically minded pro wrestlers who went out and starred him. Like one, two, three kid is every bit as influential and almost like borderline revolutionary as then because the guy was so skinny. He was obviously an enhancement talent. That's what informed his entire story in the WWF throughout the new generation. And as has been rightly pointed out by Michael Hamflet before, he was the yardstick. If you could have a good match with him, you could have a good match with anybody. And his match against Bret Hart is more celebrated than most raw matches of that era but it wasn't just that match he wasn't a one-hit wonder like he had an absolute firecrack with owen hart not just a king of the ring but like i think it was a month later just before bret and owen yes. at SummerSlam, yeah. they opened raw i think it was in june 1994 go and watch it seek it out it's an absolute june or july like a stunning physical like athletic match that completely pissed on anything that WCW was at the time and yet they're more celebrated for their work rate heavy mid card. People underestimate the clicks power in WWE was all to do with like politics and to do with the relationship with Vincent Mann. A lot of it was to do with the work or varying degrees of quality but they all cared deeply for the craft mm -hmm. in their own way and the one two three kid being such a measuring stick was kind of often their bargaining chip. It's like look what we've got on our side look what we're doing look what we're kind of informing about the product by sending him out there to wrestle any old lug that you bring in Vince. That was what they could use as a to sort of get him to bend to their wills. 
Michael Sidgwick, who else do you think should be going into the WWE Hall of Fame? Or, or who do you think will? Right, the thing is, I'm going to change the answer or the question somewhat because we often say who should go in, but frankly, like a lot of things in this company, it doesn't matter. Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame induction is unilaterally decided upon by Vince McMahon, so it doesn't matter who deserves to go in because it's just this manifestation of his whims from one year to the next. Um, so in my opinion, who sh will go in, not, ne not necessarily should, but as headliner, and I've written here in my notes, I'm just going to consult them, they are daft enough to do it. JPL, I think it's going to headline this year's. I've just got the sneaky feeling that a guy who named a WrestleMania match after the fabulous Moolah doesn't quite understand how a lot of his beloved like legends that he has in his own mind that have performed for his company are perceived by the outside bubble. And if you look at someone like JBL, he meets so many of the very strict criteria to get in. He's alive. <laughs> He's known to the modern fan base. He's always going to be in Vince McMahon's good books. I mean, this is a guy who showered them in sort of like this like horrible storm of PR. Was it last year? Hmm. The Mauro Ronaldo scandal? Yes. Uh, no, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah. yeah, 2017. And yet he's still coming back to call the Rumble. Mm -hmm. Like, Well, he, he wasn't sacked. Yeah, he wasn't sacked. They allowed him to just sort of quietly walk away. Yeah. He can and has brought on the worst PR misfires in modern history and yet still remain in their good graces. And I think Vince realizes that enough time has elapsed. Ronaldo's still within like a certain arm of the company. I think JPL is going to headline. Not necessarily that he should, but I honestly think he will. Well, the reason, the reason why we're discussing this today is the rumors are that they are going to be announced over the next few days on WWE, the first few inductees. And yeah. that would make, make a lot of sense that when you argue it like that, if, if they announce JBL on the Monday Night Raw, for example, and then you have him come out for the Rumble mm. to call the Men's Rumble match. Mm -hmm. You can have your big moment. And don't, don't forget, he's going to be going to the Hall of Fame in yeah. three months' time at WrestleMania. Like, he's known to modern audiences, and for better or worse, like, JBL's had... He's one of those guys who's lasted however many years he did as an active roster member, despite having, what, about five, ten really mm -hmm. good memorable matches. But those matches were really great for what they were. But um, JBL, as well, is a guy who can hold court on a microphone for mm -hmm. about a good hour. And all these things got to be considered, no matter how stupid they are to be warranted inclusion in a Hall of Fame for pro wrestling, but these are the things that they actually care about and pay attention to. He's an interesting case, JBL, as well, because we've often talked about how the mid-2000s is not a period of very fond nostalgia for a lot of fans, whether you were a child getting into it, whether you were kind of a disillusioned post actually or a fan, whatever your era was, there wasn't always a lot of like really hot product that kept you interested. And yet JBL does kind of inform a bit of nostalgia in fans. I think because he was so present for such a long mm -hmm. spell, that long title reign was a bit of an outlier when the belt would bounce around quite, bounce around quite a lot. It was very different from the Benoit's, the Guerrero's, the Brock Lesnar's, the Kurt Angle's, like extremely different. You know, a lot of people didn't really like SmackDown as a result of him being on top. But you know, like absence makes the heart grow fonder and he wasn't around for such a long period and you could look back on his promos and think, oh, that's quite funny. You know, we were discussing... He was a good act. Yeah. In patches, in patches. Could, and you can, he's a highlight package wrestler in a lot of regards and that's kind of what the Hall of Fame is perfect for, isn't it? Because you're just seeing like packaged up snapshots of his career. And um, what you say about him, like sort of being able to hold court on a microphone as well, the low key best part, like part of JBL's career for me was when they mic'd him up when he was on the piss watching one night stand from the crowd yeah you can watch a DVD <laughs> commentary of JBL fabulously the show. awful yeah like he buries what he hates there's moments when he's genuinely lost in the kind of the magic of it all and he's he's being a mark for a second and then he kind of switches on in his head he's at eight points and he kind of remembers who he is and he goes back into character and he's just bantering off Paul Heyman and the Blue Meanie and things like that and then doing much worse things to the Blue Meanie yep. and ruining it but that's JBL <laughs> isn't it that's JBL even on a night that you can really enjoy him he gives you something to hate about him um, so in that respect like he, he'll he'll stir, he'll stir up discussion, which I think is a benefit to the Hall of Fame these days. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, speaking of stirring up discussion, one name I'd like to put forward, which is a fairly obvious one, but one that people will be clamouring for, no doubt, in the comments, is Vader, uh, of course. Do you think they could put him into the Hall of Fame this year? I would like to think, I would like to think so because they've certainly moved away from only having to have a WWE career to speak of. Vader's WWE run was disappointingly unremarkable. Like there's a, there's a few moments in 1996 against Shawn Michaels, but virtually everything he did could be credited to the work of somebody else. And I think that's an unfair take, but all of Vader's best stuff was outside of WWE. The things he was doing in Japan, the things he was doing for WCW, but there have been countless other wrestlers that have gone in based on that mm. more than what they did for Vince McMahon. So with him being quite like a prominent, sad as it is to say, a prominent wrestler death of last year, it seems while he's maybe still a bit more relevant for that, it would maybe be a nice time to pay tribute to. Um, Vader is, again, if we're talking about a Hall of Fame that actually 
recognised the true achievements of people across professional wrestling. He should have been in decades ago. I mean, Vader, Jesus Christ, what a performer he was. He was the proto Brock Lesnar. There's very few pro wrestlers who are just so physically formidable, but yet can marry that up to like a genuine organic intensity. And if you go back and watch in particular my favourite matches of his with Sting, mm -hmm. like in a lot of ways, Sting is a main event player and in-ring worker is quite overrated, but Jesus, what a baby face is on the opposite side of that ring to Vader because Vader beat the piss out of him. Like, it just made him so sympathetic, so sympathetic. Um, Vader's stuff in the UWFI was outstanding, like, and showed his uh, versatility as a performer as well because he wasn't just this guy who could beat the tar out of um, sort of vibrant North American baby faces, but he could go in, like, shoot-style matches that were, like, really, really realistic. Um, Vader, an absolute legend. He it, has to go in. It's sort of surreal. If it meant anything. Yeah, it's sort of surreal in terms of posthumous entries uh, into the Hall of Fame sometimes are, are, are preferable for WWE because it's just what other people who they can cherry pick has to say about the person rather than the person themselves. Is that is that a fair point? You usually do one, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, one or, sounds cynical push to two. say, but yeah. But it's do, a very cynical institution. It like it's that. a very it's cynical like, institution. Here comes the dead guy. Here comes the warrior award. Here comes so-and-so. They do sort of try and break Here comes down the that. woman, which we'll get to. They've yeah. been doing that recently. Mm -hmm. It's so, them who's doing it, not us. And again, you kind of look at like whether it be recent dead wrestlers or wrestlers that have passed away the last few years, like I say, Vader feels as relevant as any others that could use. Um, and in terms of like guys that you could induct him, there's still plenty of work. A Sting being a great example of guys that have got like legendary matches. You could even like bring back guys that he worked with in WWE during a time where you don't really see a lot of these guys anymore. There's something that sticks in my mind about Vader spinning Ken Shamrock around with a right hand, telling him to ease up when they were just beating the absolute piss out of each other on what was, I believe, Shamrock's pay-per-view debut. And I just think of a guy like him, you could bring him out in the mothballs and he becomes like a huge attraction in himself for the Hall of Fame. There's going to be a section of wrestling fans that would love mm. to see Ken Shamrock back under the auspices of WWE again. So he's a known opponent to Vince McMahon. Then you've got somebody else that's potentially a draw because, again, this is a ticket-selling event. They're going to be looking for names that draw. Uh, who else do you think should uh, or could go in? Um, I've got down here, consulting my extensive notes, IRS dash banter <laughs> because Vince McMahon likes a banter inclusion hillbilly Jim Coco beware and IRS he's a road agent he's got familial ties to the company he had he wasn't very good in the ring for me but he had a very memorable mid-card run like anecdotally I've got friends who are completely lapsed they don't actually watch anymore but they always like look back on IRS fondly for what he was He's one of those cynical, easy inclusions that I'm quite surprised hasn't happened yet, actually. Mm. He could walk on the stage, uh, have a little speech. In full gimmick. In full gimmick, and then walk back and go back to Gorilla and put his headset back on and carry on like working on yeah. the show. He'd be a very, like, admin purposes. It'd be an easy one for him, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's quite quite sweet as well. I, I, like, I'm not so much against the Hall of Fame. It's just an opportunity for guys to have a nice night. Yeah, there is that. Fans. Like, yeah. it's, it's easy to be cynical towards everything WWE does. And certainly when you're looking at a Hall of Fame decided by one man, it doesn't exactly carry the most credibility. But you can tell... The wrestlers are having a nice night. I'm not saying I had a nice night watching Hillby the Gym go 65 minutes waiting for Jeff Jarrett wow. to last year. But, like, he was having the time of his career, the time of his life. It meant a lot to Jeff Jarrett, like, demonstrably as well. I mean, we were both in tears, me and Jeff. You know, it was, a, you know, it was clearly a big <laughs> night. And you see these guys having just one of the best nights of their career. So I'm not really against anyone having it. So you take IRS, like, you take countless kind of, like, WWF mid-carders that to a certain again the Wrestlemania travelling audience a lot of them will hold a, a place in their heart I think he's as, as good a case as anybody I've um, got fond memories of IRS not everyone has to have like these five star matches and all the rest of it mm -hmm. he a lot of his uh, matches had like a really good storytelling component particularly with their uh, Money Inc Money Inc underrated tag team I very think. underrated absolutely uh, who else do you do you think should go my hand I've got a bit of a daft shout because I'd like Vince McMahon to put the cat amongst the pigeons a little bit I'd like the cat him. <laughs> not, not definitely not a cat. I'd like. <laughs> He's I'd like, great. I'd like to. Take, great value. I'd like to take the most recent member of the WB alumni page and him offer Chris Jericho a spot in the Hall of Fame. Are you honestly out of your damn mind? Just to see what happens. Like, I don't want to watch the world burn as such, but I wouldn't mind Vince trying to set it back on fire. Like, Jericho's just done a podcast where he's talked about how I'm um, with All Elite. I've got, like, a bit of a three-year deal. And, yeah, the money's good. Yeah, he always drops that one in. The money's good. But he's there for creative reasons. The money's good, but that's not the reason. I'm yeah, saying. that's not the reason I'm here. <laughs> Humble brag. Um, but for Vince to just really test that and be like, oh, you don't want to work for me anymore, do you? Right, well, I'm shelving you, mate. Here's your Hall of Fame plaque. Take that and off like there. Go and try out with Cody. See how you get on there. Like, just to see how it goes because like... It'd be a flex, wouldn't it? It would. And like, I love Chris Jericho. 
but he's a bit of a mark for stuff like this as well. He does like people telling him he's good, and I'm pretty sure he's been clamouring for Vince Mad to tell him since 1999. <laughs> so I would be curious to see how he acts when given that final acknowledgement after all these years. Um, so that would be one for me. And realistically as well, he's another guy who's got like this huge legacy that thankfully is still alive. Like they are running out of guys that they can bring out and trot out on stage that could be like headline drawing, main mm. event level Hall of Famers who are still there to talk about it in a way that is going to entertain and sell tickets. We're starting to reach that point where like the old guys, old and in inverted commas because of the guys I watched when I was kids, are now like, you know, there's a generation of fans that never saw them wrestle, so just not going to be interested in what they got to say. Um, we mentioned the uh, women's role in terms of the Hall of Fame yes. and the, the sort of mandatory entry for, for that. Uh, uh, not not to lessen this woman's uh, impact on wrestling and certain role that she has to play. Uh, you often see, and we've seen over the last few years, there's a, a famous photo doing the rounds, I think, with Leo Rush in uh, of, a, of a sign clamoring for this lady to go into the Hall of Fame. Victoria uh, is a name uh, synonymous with WWE fans and someone I think... Well, we'd like we'd like to see this year's Rumble, but would also definitely definitely be deserving of a Hall of Fame spot as well. Um, it's cynical because if you look at her career and compare it to, like, let's be honest, several others, it's not particularly noteworthy. In support of Victoria, she always conducted herself like a total professional. She was a quietly good worker, at least relatively. It would be a cynical gesture for me, even though she has delivered quite a few. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I do, this gets very much into cynical territory if we're inducting someone like Victoria, even though she worked very hard in a time when it was all for not very much. I think that's what we're dealing with a little bit with a lot of women from this period of the company's history is that the, the product, the women's product was so poor that like the women's wrestlers that were trying desperately to kind of keep the train on the tracks deserve an awful amount of credit. Mm. So you could kind of put them in the Hall of Fame for that rather than like say an extended tenure along the lines of say Trish Stratus or Lita. I did really like, and I think this would be like quite a nice bit of Hall of Fame synergy. I love the story that Beth Phoenix told about Molly Holly um, paying for a training. So you could take someone again, like Molly Holly, who's had the skill of Victoria and had just as much to contribute in a pretty barren time for the division. And you could maybe put her in on the strength of maybe what she was doing quietly for others. I, I'm assuming there might be other stories of just like nice gestures that were made mm -hmm. or people that kind of like helped one another along the way. I, again, I had a bit of a different idea, a bit of a fantasy booking idea for like the female inductee this year. Um, I've, all, I've always thought there's a great storyline in inducting a current member of the roster and then having them continue on as a working Hall of Famer. Yeah. And I think it would add a real great layer to Natalia's character. If you made her a Hall of Famer for everything she's contributed, a lot in the background, she's never been considered like the main attraction of any era of the division she's been a part of. But, you know, we've seen episodes of Total Divas where she's been bumped off WrestleMania while training other women to take a spot. As the women's division and the women's revolution has improved, she's kind of been sidelined through most of it, but just been required to be there and hold Ronda Rousey's hand and things like that. I think she would really suit the kind of like deluded Hall of Famer. She has a really nice night where people pay her all the genuine respects, earnest respect, and then she takes that and she feeds it into a gimmick and she becomes this person on Raw or SmackDown who genuinely believes that like all opportunities should come her way and carries with it a little bit of arrogance and like a little bit of snark, maybe even like runs at Ronda Rousey with it as if to mm. say, yeah, you're the champion, but like, I know I'm your best friend, but so what? Like, I'm a Hall of Famer. I'd like to see that gimmick done by somebody. Yeah. And I think if anyone in that, in sort of, the, on the main roster regularly working full-time could do it, someone like her, like there's a believable tenure there that I think you can work with. All I can think about when you put the words Natalia in Hall of Fame together is just how long she'd spend crying up on that stage. <laughs> Well, yeah, but could we get Jim Knight out on a table to present to her? That'd be <laughs> hard. Jesus uh, Christ. Uh, no, Natalia is um, worthy of it, definitely. I mean, for that 2014 match with Charlotte Flair at one of the first take, the fir very first takeover? Yeah, first Yeah, day. the first takeover. Not the first, like, special, but the first takeover. I mean, one of the best WWE women, women's matches ever to this date, it I would say. It was transformative as well. Yeah, it really was. That is the word. That is the word. Uh, final entries into the Hall of Fame, then. Who else have we got? This is a bit of... Uh, should go in and will go in for me um, Rick Martel mm. Rick Martel's quite an unheralded worker because his run at the top of the AWA like sort of happened in parallel with it just disappearing off the face of the relevant earth but he did some really good work as a baby face there he's another guy who's this instantly iconic mid-card heel to fans of our old age um, you just don't forget some of the angles he's been in part of. Um, his match with Jake Roberts at WrestleMania 7, ludicrous, but just unforgettable. Um, and also, he's one of those rare wrestlers from that generation who 
horrible as this is to say, has one, stayed alive, mm -hmm. and two, has not succumbed to any major scandal at all. So as a political inclusion, not without merit, Rick Martel. Super, super polished. Like just really, you mentioned the Jake Roberts match. A blindfold match is a gimmick that a lot of people have got wrong. and he could Virtually be everyone accept him. Yeah, he could be relied upon to get that sort of stuff over. And I don't think that's, I think that's a bit of a lost art probably in the in the modern game now because wrestlers are just told to do one thing and then move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think there was a lot more like sort of effort put into the craft of everything they were given at the time. And yeah, I would, I would support something like that. Um, I'm thinking ticket selling again. And I know it's like, I know it's the biggest name and the rumours are already out there and the film's going to get released. But we have to talk about The Rock, don't we? Yeah. And we've got, of all the years, you know, there's there's a film coming out and it seems increasingly likely that he won't wrestle again. I think last year when the Saudi money became something to talk about, that was when we could all fantasy book a Rock Austin match again or something. Well, it was suddenly the... the, the odds on Rock winning this year's Rumble that was, was it. Yeah. stratospheric. That seems to have quietened back down and I'm sure he'd, not, he'll want nothing to do with taking that particular like end of WWE's way as well. He's been Salmon's made. Is, he, is that right? Yeah, I've put him oh, over. Right, this okay. is before the old uh, business. Yeah. Well, maybe, well, I don't know. I, I, like The Rock, maybe there's no money. He's not going to do it again. There's no money he wouldn't turn down, maybe, but I just think this to me seems like like as, as good an opportunity as any more time. Like WWE have got a rich history in New York. This is WrestleMania 35. Jesus. Vince likes his fives and his zeros. And he just, I think, again, if he's thinking of like a main event, uh, a headline sort of attraction for such yeah. a thing, I think we had Austin at 25. That's another one that springs to mind. He looks at big WrestleManias for, for big headliners, a big Hall of Famers. The Rock could be huge. They're competing. The Hall of Fame is competing with a wrestling show at Madison Square Garden. That, this is potentially yeah. Vince McMahon's biggest nightmare. He would have never, ever imagined that he would have had to be paying tribute to his legends while his home base gets taken up by somebody else. Is that right? Oh, yes, it is, because yes. they moved NXT to Friday. Yeah. Oh, my God. That's what they've got to compete with. They're not even competing with themselves, this show. I have to throw some of that money at The Rock. Mm -hmm. That's a good shout. Very good show. I think I, I, I do genuinely believe, and like you say, you could still have him come back and do those spots at big four pay per views like he has done over previous when's, years at WrestleMania. When's the film out? It's right around WrestleMania time as well, isn't it? Isn't it March? It's, it's got like a vested reason to actually do yeah. it. That's two nights of The Rock's stacked calendar. As inducted by Page, while it's relevant, you know. Got like Page is a shout. E Hollywood, yeah. Page, Page, is, Page a is a shout. Page is a shout. Because she's got such an, a major unheralded contribution to what women's wrestling became her match again we're going to use this word transformative her mm -hmm. match with emma on one of the first um tv matches of any like real note on nxt tv just completely changed an entire uh women's scene in the, wwe i think the reflection of how fans genuinely feel about Paige has been felt twice once in when she came back and how pleased everyone was to actually see her come back and when she was like so crudely bantered off by wwe in that recent fresh start the affection the outpouring of affection that came for Paige when she was just given that one lousy smackdown segment so oh, thanks very much see you later but people were like well actually no i quite like that character I had some stock in her as a general manager and you just ripped that away it's shocking how they did that mm -hmm. because like well, she's got a new role hasn't she and we don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Because it was kind of like, the co they couldn't necessarily say, right, okay, what's happened here is Raw's terrible. Um, it's the one that Vince McMahon pays the most attention to. SmackDown somehow is quite good in spite of him, but for storyline consistency's sake, we're going to have to pretend SmackDown's as bad as Raw, even though it really isn't. Mm. And we're going to just make uh, Paige the scapegoat. We always that. come back to the same point here. Baron Corbin ruins everything. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Maybe he'll go into the Hall of Fame this Who year. Who would you like to go in? Uh, I, th I think it's, uh, someone like The Rock would be uh, is the, probably the, the strongest call of all. I, I completely agree with the film coming out and, of course, with the competition that they have on that weekend. And like you say, you need a headliner. You certainly need someone to bring the crowd in. The amount of people, even in this office, we've, we've talked about if, if we were to go to WrestleMania... I mean, it's, there's no real question. There's, there's devout WWE fans in this, in this office who say... Singular. Look, so with you. <laughs> who say, who, but even, who even say, look, I mean, there's, there's no competition as compared to this, the supercard that we're going to be seeing in, in Madison Square Garden. And if you're going to try and tear people away from that, a, can, a chance to hear him speak for, yeah. for, for an hour is... Is, is, the, what, is he the only guy? There are a few real draws, aren't there? Yeah, is, is, there are a few real draws. And is there anyone who hasn't yet been inducted who you'd want to speak for as long as The Rock? I could have a two-hour Rock promo if yeah. you're on form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and you could, like I say, you could still keep him resting. It's, this does not mean the end of his WWE career by any stretch of the imagination. It'll be, if anything, unchanged. It'll be just like we've seen with Hogan and Stone Cold coming back for the odd segment or match or whatever, mm -hmm. if, if uh, their bodies allow. 
I can completely see that. But let me know who you think you think should be in the uh, WWE Hall of Fame 2019 in the comments section below, or you can tweet at us at WhatCultureWWE. Watch you there on Twitter. You can follow all three of us. You can follow Michael Hamflit at Michael Hamflit. You can follow Michael Sidgwick at M um, Sidgwick. You can follow me at Adam Wilborn. Don't forget to subscribe to What Culture Wrestling on iTunes or Spotify for daily podcasts. My thanks to the Dudley Boys. Thank you for watching, and we will see you soon. Bye.